All right, so today we're talking about Isaiah 25, and it's, uh, it, it's kind of a, a well, let me, let me start it this way. Last week, Isaiah prophesied himself into a corner because he talked about the end of Tyre, and in chapter 24, he talks about the end of the world. So, I mean, once you talk about the end of the world, what do you talk about next? It's all gone. Well, in chapter 25, Isaiah tells us what happens after the end of the world. So it's, it's the continuation, what God is going to do after he winds it all up. And this, it's kind of a, it's a relatively short chapter, but it can be a confusing chapter because it just, there's a lot of stuff packed into it. So I thought what I'd do today is, is take a sort of an academic view of this passage. I, and I apologize for that. I'll try not to make it boring, but I just, I wanted us to see what would happen if we really just looked at the chapter and let the text talk to us and see what the text tells us. Now, the, I, I'm going to give us kind of a method to go through that you can certainly use on your own. And one of the nice things about this method is it doesn't require commentaries. It doesn't require anything else other than just looking at the text and seeing what the text tells you and kind of getting behind the confusion of the text. So we'll sort of go through the process. And, and I, I think I, at least to my satisfaction, have figured out what the text means. Uh, it doesn't mean that's the right answer, but it just means that's what I figured out for me. Uh, there may be other right answers. You may come up with something different, but this is just a way to look at the text and really figure out what's going on. So that's, we're going to be looking at chapter 25 today. Now, to start off, I've got a couple of little stories. Joel has, has been a great influence on my life. So uh, these, unfortunately, are not true stories. Yeah, you know, I, they didn't come from a spiritual giant. I just kind of made them up. But I, hopefully, they'll fit the lesson. So the first story is you have to assume that uh, one thing impossible. You have to assume that you know, without a shadow of a doubt, that the stock market on December 31st, the end of this year, is going to be up. 50%. Now, I don't know how what that would work or exactly what that means, but you know, without a shadow of a doubt, the stock market is going to be up 50% on December 31st. Now, if, if you've got a lick of sense in your, your body and you know that's what's going to happen, you're going to put all your money in the stock market. And people are going to look at you funny and they're going to say, why did you put all your money in the stock market? Why are you taking such a big risk? And you say, it's not a risk. I know what's going to happen. Stock market is going to be you know, very high on December 31st. I know, so I am willing to, to base my, my life on what I know is going to happen by December 31st. And now if you knew what was going to happen on December 31st, and all of a sudden the market goes down 50% in November, would you be concerned? No, because you know that the market's going to be up 50% come the end of December. Might go up, might go down. You don't care because you know what the end result is going to be on December 31st. Now, you sell everything on December 31st because who knows what happens on January 2nd, but you know that. So you live your life according to that. And when people come to you and say, oh, I'm so worried. I, what, the stock market's down 30 percent. The president's going to, you know, doesn't matter. I know what's going to happen on December 31st. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. That's the first story. Second story is real life story. And, and I think most of us are old enough to remember this. And I don't remember the exact date. It was probably back in the 80s. But it was the Olympics. And the United States hockey team was playing the Russian hockey team in the finals. And it was a, a great game. And everybody was excited. And the finals were going to be televised at about, and I don't remember exactly, but about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a real Cinderella story. The Russians were supposed to be able to beat the world, and the Americans had beat them. And this was the last game, and it was just all on the line, and it was going to start at 2 o'clock. So I was a sales rep at the time, so I made sure to schedule an appointment at 1.30 at my house. So I would be ready for the, the match to start at two o'clock. And it was a great, I don't even like hockey, but it was an exciting hockey match. And it got down to the end. The Americans were ahead just by a little bit and it looked like the Russians were going to score. And I was biting my nails and sweating. And, oh, are the Americans, come on, Jesus, make the Americans win. <laughs> and I, I even put my hands on the TV screen. And, and lo and behold, the Americans won. And, you know, great rejoicing and, and everybody and I decided to take the rest of the day off since I was a sales rep. Now, later on that night, they played that game on TV, that hockey match on TV. And I watched it again because it was a great hockey match. But you know what? It wasn't anywhere near as exciting the second time through. Got to the last couple of minutes. It looked like the Russians were going to score. And I went, don't worry. The Russians aren't going to score. I know what's going to happen. 
So keep those two stories in mind as we go through Isaiah, because I think they apply to what we're going to be, be seeing here in Isaiah. So God is going to tell us how it all is going to end. God is going to tell us what the stock market is going to be on December 31st. God is, is showing us a videotape of the end of the world so we can watch it and we know who has won. And if anybody is any confused, God wins. God came as one to know and we're on it. So that's good. God wins in the, in fact, God has already won. If you, if you look at it from his perspective. So we need to keep that in mind as we go through. So we're looking at this passage, and I want to suggest how anyone could, could analyze any chapter in the Bible, just some good methods to use. First of all, think context, and then uh, look at your passage and divide it and summarize it. Uh, and, and I'll talk some more about that because I think that's a tool that we don't use often enough is this idea of dividing and summarizing. Powerful tool to use with the text. So anyhow, what's the context? Let's, let's look at the sequence and kind of go back and, and see what we've done. The first five chapters of Isaiah are an indictment against Judah. Now remember, Isaiah is an assembled book. Isaiah did not sit down one afternoon and prophesy 66 passages. Isaiah, what we have today, is the result of decades of prophecy that someone, maybe Isaiah, maybe a scribe, I don't know, is put together in a sequence. So the sequence is important, and it's important for us if we want to find the meaning to kind of trace the sequence through. So it starts off with those five-chapter indictment against Judah. This is all the stuff that Judah has done bad. Then chapter six is Isaiah's call, that throne room call where uh, God wants to send somebody, and Isaiah goes, ooh, 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 send me. And then chapter seven through 12, is all about how God's kingdom is going to surpass any earthly kingdom. It's, it's talking about the Messiah, talking about how his kingdom will come back, how all these earthly powers will be destroyed, that, that whole idea of Emmanuel, God is with us, and Isaiah's two weirdly named children, and I, I don't even remember what they are, Booty, Fastus, and Spress, I don't know, but remember, they're messages that God is with his people and God will conquer. Now, the normal question is, okay, God, if you're going to conquer, how are you going to do that? Well, chapters 13 through 23 tells the audience exactly how God is going to do that. God is going to do this by bringing woe and an oracle against these people, and woe against this people, and on and on. And Tyre, which Deb did last week, uh, was the last group of people that God was going to bring a woe against, but it was essentially everybody that was around Judah. Now, chapter 24, that, that woe spreads to the whole earth. So not only is everyone on the earth is condemned, the earth is condemned too. The earth is going to be uh, destroyed and redeemed. And we're in a little section here, 24 through 27, it's sometimes called the little apocalypse. And uh, apocalypse just means revelation. The Greek word is apocalypsis, I think. But all that means is revelation. And that's where we get the title for the book of Revelation. Uh, it's, it's a message from God about the end of the world. And that is what is, uh, Isaiah is telling us now. And that is what the person who assembled all this stuff is, is telling us now. So he's kind of worked up the judgment, the how God is going to do it, who suffers, the world suffers. And now here's what happens after the world ends. And it, it, it's, it, if you could read Isaiah and Revelation side by side, it would be a great thing because they're both talking about the same thing. John has exactly the same problem in Revelation when he, when he brings the world to an end and everybody gets judged. Well, what do you do for a big encore about that? Well, that's Revelation 20, where John talks about us living with God in a physical relationship on a day-to-day -day basis in the new Jerusalem, which is heaven, because that's where God is. So both these books are talking about the same thing. So both of these books are very, very similar. They're all talking about the end of the world and the redemption of the world. So we've seen the videotape now. We know that God has won. So the question is, well, so what? That's what Isaiah 25 is going to be talking about. Now, second thing I want to talk about is literary markers in the text that help us identify where the text starts and stops. Now, we have a real challenge because when Isaiah set out to write down, I probably said this before, he didn't write chapter and verse. He just started writing and he just wrote it all out. And at some point over time, 1300s, 1500s, a man came along and divided the chapters and verses. Now, that, that's a good tool, because remember, Isaiah is a scroll. It's a big rolled-up scroll, probably be about this big. And if we didn't have the chapters and verses, and you wanted to find a passage in Isaiah, I, you know, I'd say, okay, everybody unroll their Isaiah scroll about 25 feet and start looking for this verse. And that would be as good as we can do. 
So the chapters and verses are useful, but they're not divinely inspired. So we look at our Bibles and their paragraphs and all kinds of neat things and chapters, and we have to be careful not to let those divisions influence what the text really says. So I'm gonna kind of take you through this, not in as much detail as we went into class, everybody relax. Mm -hmm. but, but I want us to just look at the text and see what the text tells us. So if we look at chapter 24, the very end of uh, chapter 24 is, then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem and his glory will be before his elders. Talking about the end of the world in that chapter. We look at chapter 25, we see a very different change in address and tone. Chapter 25 starts, O Lord, you are my God. This is no longer talking about what God will do. This is direct address to God. Now that is a literary marker telling us, eh, time out, subject has changed. So we, we can say for, I don't know for sure, but there's a really good chance that this is where our passage starts. Now, the next question we have to ask us is, where does our passage end? And that gets to be a little harder because you, you read along and you get to the end of 25 and you start in 26 and they're still talking about the same thing. It's still in that day, a key of the end times. You go along, blah, 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 uh, chapter 27, it's still talking about in that day. You keep going all the way through chapter 27, you get to the end of the 27 and you talk about the holy mountain in Jerusalem. Okay, cool, fine. You get to 28 and now it changes. There's a, a subject change we've gone from talking about what will happen in that day to a woe oracle. So we know that's the end of our passage. So even though my Bible divides that into, I don't know, three chapters maybe, when Isaiah was writing it, it was only one chapter. So if we really want to dig into this, we ought to look at 25, 26, and 27 all together because that was a sense passage. That was, a, that was what Isaiah was talking about before he changed the subject. That was a prophesy a prophecy of Isaiah. But now let's go back and, and see if we can cut this down a little bit, because I know y'all don't want me to talk about three chapters. Um, if you look at just chapter 25, um, I think that's kind of the introduction to the, the passage, and we could talk a lot about how it foreshadows and all kinds of stuff. I'm not going to get into that. But if we look at it, we go down and we uh, look at verse 8, and verse 8 ends, for the Lord has spoken. Okay, that probably is a good indication that the end is near because when God speaks that probably is in verse 9 we get a response to God speaking then in verse 10 we get something entirely different we're no longer talking to God we're no longer uh, talking about what God is going to do with us all of a sudden we're talking about Moab so again a subject change and to my way of thinking that would indicate that uh, verse 9 is the end of our passage so really what we're looking at here, I, I've gone all the way around both elbows to get here. What we're looking at is our passage really is Isaiah 25, 1 through 9. That's the sense that Isaiah was talking about here. And if we look a little more closely, Isaiah 1 through 5 is all direct address to God. And then in, in Isaiah 25, 6, it starts talking about what God will do. And it's, again, different subject change. So we've got two parts to our passage. We've got Isaiah 1 through 5, and we've got Isaiah 6 through 9, maybe 6 through 10. So that, if nothing else, that gives us a handle on what we need to focus on. So I, I think the next step is to look at each of those passages and then summarize those passages. If, if we were in class, I'd get the class to actually write out a paragraph summary of Isaiah 1 through 5. And then when they got finished with that, I'd say, okay, now condense that paragraph into a sentence. And when they got done with that, I'd say, now condense that sentence into a word. And that's, that's a, not an easy process to go through, but it really forces you to figure out what is important to the passage. So we're kind of going to kind of do that as we go through the passage. So let's, let's actually deal with the text now. Enough, enough introduction. You've heard everything that John Morris knows. Now let's hear what the Lord said to Isaiah, and Isaiah said to us. So this is Isaiah 25, 1 through 10. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. For you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago with perfect faithfulness. For you have made a city unto a heap, a fortified city into a ruin. A place of strangers is a city no more. It, is, it will never be built. Therefore, a strong people will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. 
for you have been a defense for the helpless, a defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the breath of the ruthless is like a rain against the wall. Like heat and a drought, you subdue, subdue the uproar of aliens. Like heat and by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces of marrow, refined aged wine. And on this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all people, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. He will swallow up death for all time, and the Lord God will wipe tears away from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Behold, it will be said in that day, this is our God for whom we have waited that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So what is the text really telling us? Go back and just look at the text and see. Isaiah 25, 1. It's direct address. It's direct address to uh, Yahweh. And, and literally in Hebrew, Hebrew is kind of a weird language. It's only three words in the first verse or that first part. And it literally in the Hebrew, it's Yahweh. Elohim, you. Okay, and then we have to figure out that Yahweh Elohim, you are my God. But what Isaiah is really doing is praising God. Again, if we just look at the text, what does the text say? I will exalt you. I will give thanks to your name. Isaiah is praising God. And the first thing he praises about God is his name. This is the Yahweh name. This is the personal name that Moses uh, re, that God revealed to Moses. This is the name of the creator God. This is the, the God that created it by saying, let there be. And the implication is he can uncreate it by saying, let there not be. And he can do a new creation by saying, let it be again. This is the creator God we're talking about. Um, so what am I praising him for? I'm praising him for his wonders. And we know all through the Old Testament, we've seen all the wonders of God and, and all that he can do can do and all that he will do and then it's interesting here and actually i didn't pick this up until i was going through the, the study again look at verse one he's exalting god he's giving thanks to god for his work wonders but he's using the future tense he's saying okay in the future i will exalt you i will give thanks to your name even though some of these things may not have happened yet Right? Isaiah is so sure that these things he's talking about are going to happen, the end of the world, the redemption, the restoration, all those things in this chapter, that he can start praising God for it right now. Okay? I think that's an incredibly powerful thing. Isaiah hasn't seen it, but God has said it, and it will happen. Now, excuse me, I just a, a drink of coffee. I'm getting too excited here. <laughs> Languages reveal a lot of, about the people that, that use the language. Uh, for instance, in English, up until recently, we have used uh, the masculine uh, uh, pronoun for just a, an indeterminate gender. You know, we, we'll say he or him or something like that when we really don't mean he or him. We just mean genetic, generically, just somebody. And I think that says something about our, our culture and the assumption of masculinity and, and all kinds of things like that. Uh, Hebrew was the same way. And one of the interesting things, at least to me, about Hebrew is there, they had past, present, future tense verbs, just like we do in English. But they had one construction in Hebrew that was called the prophetic future. That is just, is fascinating to me. It was a verb that was in the present tense. I, I will, I, I praise you, Lord. Uh, or the, the Lord does something. But it was translated with the future tense implication or, or aspect. So what the way it's translated is, I will praise you. You will do this. This will happen. And the idea was, even though they used the present tense, if they were talking about what God would do, and that's the only time they used this, that they would use the present tense, but they knew God would do it in the future, so they could interpret that present tense as a future tense verb. And that's what's going on here. Isaiah is so certain about what's going to happen, that he's using that prophetic future and saying, you will do this, and I will do this, and he's using the present tense, but he's talking about what's going to happen in the future. And I think that speaks greatly about his worldview, and I think might be the key to the passage for us. Just remember that, just, you know it is going to happen so much, you can go ahead and start anticipating and praising for it right now.
So it's praising for the, the wonders of the Lord formed long ago. So I, again, I, I think we have to remember that what Isaiah is talking about and what we see today, because remember, Isaiah and Revelation are tied together. Revelation really is the last book of Old Testament prophecy. For your, we all that don't know it, Revelation's in the wrong part. It ought to be right after Malachi or whatever. Last book of Old Testament prophecy, because it talks about how, how it all ends. Right? Um, Isaiah is talking about things that were happened and planned long ago. God knew exactly what was going to happen in the exile. God knew exactly what was going to happen with the, the birth of it and crucifixion and resurrection and ascension of his son, Jesus. It's not like God has three or four plans and he tries this one and he tries this one and he tries this one. He has known all along what was going to happen and he has planned for it because he is in control. And I think we get hung up on this sometimes because we experience, oh, this is deeply philosophical. I apologize for y'all. But we experience time linear, linearly as a line. We, you know, we're always looking at the, the present and always in the past, and we're kind of moving along this line of time. And we can't see beyond today. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But I don't think God is like that. I think God is above time, and he sees all time as just one continuum. So to him, it's just all, it's all there because he is up above time looking down and there's the creation and there's the recreation. It's just all one thing. And to him, it is all happening. It has already happened. It will happen. And I think, again, that's that little bit of that uh, Hebrew prophetic tense there. So God has formed all these things. God has perfect faithfulness. If God has said it, it will happen. So what does that mean to me? Again, to go back to the beginning, I know what the world is going to be like when the end happens. It's still going to be violent. Still bad things are going to happen, but God is going to win. God is going to redeem us. God is going to restore us. God is going to provide for us. As bad as this world might get, I know God is still in control, and when he is ready in his mind, it's going to happen, and he's going to restore me. Okay? When things go bad, i got to remember that. When the presidential election doesn't go the way I want to, regardless of which side you're on, I got to remember that. When the stock market goes down 50%, I got to remember that. When, you know, when, when something bad happens to me, I got to remember that. God is in control, and he is already one, and he will restore and redeem me, and I can start praising him for it right now. So if we look at verse 2, it's, it's all talking about the faithfulness of God. What has God done? God has done exactly what he said he was going to do. All those war oracles and all that stuff, God's going to do it. And God doesn't do anything by surprise. If you remember way back when the, the Hebrews entered the promised land, God said, okay, now watch out, y'all. That's not exactly what he said, but he said, y'all are going to be tempted. Y'all are going to try to stray away from me. And if you do, I'm going to punish you. If you uh, leave me, I will send a people to drive you out of the promised land. And he told them that for hundreds of years. And now the time has come for that prophecy to be fulfilled, that judgment to be uh, given them, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. So, I mean, the good news is God's going to do exactly what he said. The bad news is God's going to do exactly what he said. We're all going to be judged. We're all going to have to stand before him. Now, from our perspective, if we're Christians, we're saved. And Jesus has already paid the price for all of our sins. But I, I, st I still think everybody gets judged because God is going to be faithful. God said it's going to happen, and it will happen. We'll look at verse 3. It's kind of the, the reaction of, of the enemies. Okay, God said, God said I'm going to do it, and I did it, and the end of the world is here, and what are you going to do about it? Nothing but die. The, the, the strong people, the ruthless people that have been giving Israel trouble and Judah trouble, their reaction is they're going to glorify God. Cities of ruthless nations will revere you. And this is exactly what we see in the New Testament. Paul talks about it. John talks about it in Revelation. It's the ingathering of the nations. All right. It's the, the marriage celebration of Jesus. It's everybody will either voluntarily or forcefully be, requ be required, will recognize Jesus as Lord. If you think about Philippians 2, it talks about everything that Jesus did to, to, be, um, uh, to, to be his ascension, to be glorified. And it says, every knee will bow and every name will recognize that you are Lord. So there will come a time, even everybody says bad things about Jesus and uh, all the, the world now, 
there will come a time when even they will admit, either voluntarily through conversion or on their judgment, that Jesus is Lord. There is no escaping that. It will happen. So that was the reaction of the, the, the strong. If you go uh, to 25, 4, and 5, sorry, I'm getting dyslexic here, you see the reaction of the weak. And, and, and this, is, this should be us, because if you, know, you talk about the Sermon on the Mount, if, if we are weak in Christ, we're strong. If we're weak in the world, we're strong in Christ. We'll just read this, because lots of good images here. This is verse uh, 4. For you have been a defense for the helpless. And that is exactly what the helpless need. A defense for the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat. For the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against the wall. I just, I love those two images. It's the idea of, of shade from the heat. If you, you guys have ever hiked out the West in Death Valley or the deserts, the sun is deadly. And that's what they had to deal with in the Middle East. And a little bit of shade can be life-saving. Um, it, it's, it's amazing that you, you get in the shade, you pour a little water on you and it evaporates and you can really cool off and save your life. But if you're stuck out in the, in the bright sunlight, you're in deep, deep trouble. There, a couple of years ago, we just gotten back from Death Valley and there was a, a story about a, a woman and her husband that had hiked out into Death Valley, just the, the same exact place we had hiked out and died out there because they got so hot. Now, I think they probably hiked farther and, and stuff like that, but the heat can kill you. And that's what this, this God is a shade from the sun. And I just, I love this image of the breath of the ruthless is like a rainstorm against the wall. So it just, it hits it and bounces off and it doesn't hurt the wall at all. And I just, in these days of COVID with the little viruses coming at you, I, you know, that's my prayer, that, that, we will, that God will be our wall, God will be our shield, God will be our defense, and all those evil things that are coming at us will just bounce off and, and roll away, okay? More images like heat and a drought, you subdue, subdue the uproar of the aliens, and another translation of that could be foreigners. So the people who are crying out against you, the people who are insulting your children, the people who are insulting Christians, the people who are insulting the Jews, you will, take, you will take care of them. You will deal with them. You will silence them. Like heat by the shadow of a cloud, the song of the ruthless is silenced. So heat is silenced when the cloud comes over. The song of the ruthless, silenced when God is there. They won't have a thing to say except, oops, picked the wrong side here. Right? Now, okay, so that's, that's what 25, 1 through 5 is. If we had to summarize that, how would we do it? And again, I, I just, I go back to the text. What does the text start off with? Praise. Okay, and then it says, what am I praising you for? Then it gives some descriptions about what God has done in his faithfulness. And then it, the, the thing ends. So if I had to summarize the first little part, I would say praise. And I've had to, you know, give a longer discussion. It's praise for what God will do. And if I had to give an even longer uh, phrase, I'd say and I can start praising him now for what he will do in the future. And if I were a preacher, I would say, now you need to decide on how you're going to lead your life based on the fact that God will do this in the future and you know it and you're praising him now. But I, I'm not here to, 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 to sermonize. Okay. So the first, I, I've kind of condensed that first passage. My word for that first passage is praise. That praise is something I can understand. So to me, and I, again, guys, I could be wrong. This is just what I'm coming up with, other people may have a different idea, but the point of that first five verses is praise, and everything else, when I try to interpret it, I'm going to interpret it under the basis of it all has something to do about how I praise God, what I praise Him for, or what God, what God has done. Now, let's look at the second segment, 25, 6 through 9. A celebration has replaced the silence of the ruthless. Their, their song has been quieted. Now we have a banquet. Okay, God is telling people, I'm sorry, Isaiah is telling people what God is going to do. Isaiah has been talking to God. Now he's going to say to the people, this is what God's going to do. He's going to feed you. Okay, and what is he going to feed you? Good stuff. Uh, so, it, and again, we'd have to pick the things today that we would like. I know lobster tails and uh, brisket or whatever it is, whatever the best food is, that's what God is going to do. Whatever the best wine is, that's what God is going to provide. In fact, he says it twice, a banquet of aged wine. And then he says refined aged wine. 
So it's going to be good wine. I just, I, I, I hope my Southern Baptist friends will forgive me, but I just think it's so, so fascinating that when Jesus turned water into wine in the New Testament, the book of John, he didn't turn it into just wine. He turned it into good wine. So if you get something from God, it is good. So if we, if we look at, at verse 6, what I think we see is that God has the power to do what he needs to do. Uh, if in verse 25, 1, it, it talks about just Lord, L-O-R-D, Yahweh, but in verse 6, it's the L-O-R-D of hosts, the, the, the Yahweh of the armies of heaven, this idea of military power. And military power, you can do anything you want in the idea of the time. So again, today, we talk about, you know, this, this country has the world's biggest army, or, or we, th we associate that with power. I want us to be a little careful here, because I don't think God is limited by the extent or the power of his armies. God does not need his armies for a victory. It's a symbol of his overall power. God created things by saying, let it be. God can uncreate things by saying, let it not be. It's not like he has to fight anybody. It's not like it's a struggle. He doesn't work up a sweat. He speaks and it happens. So let's just kind of kind of keep that in, in mind. So God is going to, God is powerful. He can do this. God has a place for us. It talks about this mountain, and if you read through Isaiah, what he's talking about is Mount Zion, which is Jerusalem, okay? This, this new heaven, this new earth that we see about in, in the book of Revelation, Isaiah is talking about the same thing here, is a physical place. Now, I, I don't understand exactly how it works, but God has promised me that he is going to create a new creation not marred by sin, in perfection, that will be with us for eternity. However he wants to work that out is how he'll work it out. I don't have to worry about that. I just have to enjoy it. But it's a physical place with a physical body, with a physical life. So it's something that I have to look forward to, that God is going to restore us. Right? However we need to be restored, if I used to have six toes on my left foot, I'll only have five toes in the new restoration. God will make us perfect with him for eternity. So we, we get a dwelling, we get a place, we get fellowship. We get fellowship with God. If you go to banquet with somebody, your friends with all everybody around you, your friends with whoever's um, giving the banquet. We have fellowship with God. Now, the next few verses are going to expand on that. But whatever was separating us from God is removed. Whatever was separating us from the people around us is removed. Okay? And then God has... Uh, the provision for us. He's got the banquet. We'll have the, the best. And I, I think this ties into the New Testament, again, with the end gathering in the nations, the wedding celebration of the Lamb, this, this, this whole idea of God giving us a feast of everything we need. We need shelter, we need food, we need water, we need fellowship. God is going to give us all of that in perfection. Okay. So now, I, in 27, uh, I'm sorry, 25, 7, and 8, we see a little bit more, how is God going to do this? Well, God, you don't know this guy across this table from me. There's no way that he and I can be at the table together because I don't know, he, he has bad table manners or whatever. God's going to fix that. Look what happens in uh, 7 and 8. And on this mountain, again, in Jerusalem, physical place, he will swallow up the covering which is over all people, even the veil which is stretched over all nations. Now, I, I struggle a little bit what this, this covering is, and I looked at the Hebrew and looked at some different translations. And you can also call that covering a shroud. And, and so the first thing that, that came to me is God's going to remove death. And I think if you look at the next verse, there, there's some sense to that. But I, th I think if you look at it from a New Testament point of view, we're told several times in the New Testament that we're reminded that we are marred, that we don't see God perfectly, that we are not our, we are not as we will be in the new creation. Paul talks about this. Other people talk about this. And that may be the shroud that's being removed. And if that shroud is removed and we can see God better, then I think we will also be able to see God in the people around us. And then if we're all united in God by definition, we will be united in the people among us. And all of a sudden, it's not going to make any difference with the guy with bad table manners or whatever. We look at him, we're going to see God. When he looks at us, he's going to see God. When she looks at us, she's going to see God. So God is going to remove whatever mars the relationship. If it's death, it's gone. If it's the, the marred image of sin in us, that's gone. If it's fellowship, that we're having problems with, that's gone. Whatever stands between us and God is gone. So that's my best guess of what's going on there. There might be a little bit in the New Testament 
uh, after the crucifixion when the veil of the temple is split, because another word that we could use there is veil instead of shroud. And the idea there is whatever was separating mankind from entering the Holy of Holies in the temple was torn apart from the top to the bottom. A human would tear it apart from the bottom to the top. So this is sort of a, a God kind of thing, removing the final barrier. And I think that's, that's what Isaiah is talking about. Whatever the barrier is, if it's a physical barrier, gone. If it's a spiritual barrier, the shame of sin is removed. Okay, it, it look at verse 8. He will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and he will remove the reproach of his people from all the earth. All that problems of sin, gone. Okay? Dealt with in Jesus. For the Lord has spoken. That's it. Once God speaks, it's done. Now, you, you, when I started seminary, they used to joke, uh, the Bible says it, I believe it, that settles it. Along about my third year in seminary, it struck me that that was only two-thirds right. The Bible says it, whether I believe it or not doesn't make any difference. The Bible says it, that settles it. And the point I'm trying to make here is God has spoken. If God has spoken, it will happen. You can bet your last penny on that. It's going to happen. You can live your life based on that. Okay. God is going to do what people couldn't do. I, I can't remove the mar of sin from my body. I can't bring people back to life. I can't do a new creation. I can't restore and redeem everybody. But God can, and God said, it's going to happen. Hadn't told us when, but he said, it's going to happen, and this is what it's going to look like. And even more important, this is what you're going to get on the other side. So relax. You know what the stock market's going to be. You've already watched. We're watching the videotape. If, I mean, John, the gospel, uh, Revelation, full of special effects and clouds and scorpions and Black Hawk helicopters. And all. I mean, it's, it's real fun to, to watch. Or, but the important point is we already know what's going to happen. God has already won. So 25.9 is God's response to the people. I'm sorry, the people's response to God. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord from whom we have waited, and let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Now, this is just me. I'm almost certainly wrong on this, but it just, it's interesting to me that if you look up the, the Hebrew for his salvation, last two words or last word in that verse, the word salvation is Yeshua, which is Jesus' name. Now, I'm not saying that's on purpose, but I just, I think it is very interesting that we say Jesus, we don't think, think anything about it, but Jesus means salvation, and it all ties back to this is my salvation in the Old Testament. All right, so that's, that's people's response. So if I had to summarize this, I'd say restoration. So this, this little paragraph is about restoring creation, it's about restoring fellowship. It's about restoring relationships with God and everybody else. All the barriers are removed. It's about restoration. Now, if I put that together in a sentence, it's restoration and praise, or praise God because of what he will do in restoration. Okay? So I've kind of I've torn this passage apart, and hopefully I've shown you how it can build back up. To, to be something that, you know, for the rest of your life, somebody says, I, Isaiah 25, you go, oh yeah, that's praise and restoration. And you can build on it for there, but you've got a key to handle the entire passage. And even more, you've got a key to handle 26 and 27, since remember, they're all about this anyhow. <coughs> Excuse me. So what? Okay, I, you know, I've given you a, 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 at least a master's level little lecture here, maybe even a PhD level at, at certain points. So what? God has said it, it's going to happen. We can already start praising God for it. I don't know when the world will end. I don't know what's going to happen, but I know God is in control, and I know what God will do. He will redeem me. He will restore me. He will give me a new creation where I can live with him in perfection for eternity. It doesn't get any better than that, by definition. God has spoken. Now, I can choose to believe it or not. If I believe it, I ought to have faith and confidence in how I can live my life today. Bad things are going to happen. 
Doesn't matter because I know how it all ends. Even if the worst happens and I die, God can take care of that. He has shown us how he can take care of that in the resurrection of his son. And he has promised, God has spoken, said, John, I'm going to do it for you. Now, just so none of y'all forget, or, or if you have trouble recognizing me in the, the new creation, I will be 6'4", and I will have a full head of hair. So just look for a tall, good-looking guy with a full head of hair. And that's me, 6'4". Just watch for him. But whatever is wrong, God's going to do it. And we ought to live our lives today in the knowledge of that, in the basis of that. We ought to live our lives. I'm sorry, I'm preaching here. But we ought to live our lives so in the midst of trouble, people will come to us and say, how can you be calm? The president has changed. The COVID has happened. The this has happened. The that has happened. And, you know, you, you're, you're going through it with me. You're suffering with me. But it doesn't seem like this suffering is touching you like it's touching me. What's the difference? People ought to see that difference. And it ought to give us an opportunity to say, let me show you the videotape. I know what the stock market's going to be like. I know how it's all going to end. We don't have to worry about the day-to-day -day ups and downs. I think that's what this passage is calling us to do. Okay, quick PS now. Um, 10 through 12 is all about Moab. I don't know why this is here about Moab, other than the fact that it's just an indication that God is going to take care of them, whatever it needs. And it might be, I, I don't know this for sure, but it might be that when Isaiah originally made this prophecy, that Moab was a current enemy or Moab was causing some trouble. So he was using this as an example, because I, I just, I know this, you know, that, that, Jewish deacon in the back row said, yeah, but what about Moab? Did you see what they did to us last week? And Isaiah's going, okay, here's what God's going to do to Moab. And Moab gets destroyed. So I, I, I don't know what that is, but that's just kind of my explanation of why those extra three verses are, are had, added there in the passage. So let's pray. Lord, help us believe. Lord, help us have faith in your faithfulness. Help us live our lives in the knowledge that you have already won, that you have already taken care of everything we need, that even when things go bad, and they will, that you will restore us. You will redeem us in every way. You will remove everything that keeps us away from perfection. Lord, I pray that we would change our lives, that we would live differently today on the basis of that. We would live differently tomorrow on the basis of that. And people would see your confidence in us and people would come to us and we would be able to tell them about you and the redemption through your son. Lord, we raise up all these prayers for healing, for help, for all the things we need and just pray that we would all come back together again safely next week. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Mm -hmm.